Undoubtedly, one of the most important discoveries of the last 100 years has been the hormone insulin. Every day, millions of people around the world rely on some form of insulin to manage their diabetes. Unfortunately, as we enter the centennial of its discovery in 1921, there is still a gap in accessibility due to the market cost for patients who need it. In fact, it is estimated that insulin is sold for 17 times more than how much it actually costs to make. To illustrate the impact on everyday people, we've conducted an interview with Silas, a diabetic living in the U.S. who is currently struggling with the price of insulin. Hey Silas, it's great to have you on. So, tell us about your experience with diabetes. Yeah, so I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes when I was 7 years old. I remember on that day I was feeling really sluggish, my mouth was really dry, and I just felt sick. Next thing I remember, I woke up in a hospital with my parents by my side. The doctor explained to us that I was a type 1 diabetic. My parents really wanted me to be independent, so I quickly learned how to check my blood sugar and to use the insulin pen. Eventually, it became second nature. I see. Did your parents ever struggle with paying for your treatment? Well, my parents' insurance was pretty good and covered most of it throughout my childhood. Then, when I graduated, I got a job of my own with pretty good benefits that also covered the treatment. Recently, though, the company went under and I was out of a job. I paid out of pocket for insulin for the first time and was shocked. See, I take a special kind of fast-acting insulin called Novolog, which costs around $300 a month. When you add on the cost of test strips and needles, you can see how pricey it gets. Wow. And have you ever considered heading to Canada to get the Canadian equivalent? Yeah, I'm definitely considering it. The Canadian equivalent for Novolog only costs around $30 in Canada, so it's definitely cheaper. But that really isn't a sustainable option, since I'd have to make the trek every month. Thank you for taking the time to do this interview, Silas. Silas, like over 7 million diabetic Americans, relies on daily insulin injections to survive. But with neighboring Canada having only one-tenth of the U.S. population, Americans cannot rely on Canada to get affordable insulin all the time. But what does it mean to be diabetic, and why is insulin so expensive? To understand that, tune into the following report. Our metabolism converts the food that we consume into energy to keep us going. Carbohydrates, such as sugars, are a major source of this energy. Among the many types of sugars we consume, the simplest is glucose, which is at the center of many energy-related processes. In a fasting state, an organ called the pancreas secretes the glucagon hormone, which acts on the liver and fat cells. This causes the liver to release stored glucose and causes fat breakdown, releasing fatty acids into the circulation. In a fed state, blood glucose levels increase as the body breaks down food that was consumed. In response, pancreatic beta cells secrete the insulin hormone. This causes an uptake of glucose into various tissues for storage, ultimately decreasing blood sugar levels. Tight control of blood sugar is very important, and imbalances are associated with metabolic diseases like diabetes mellitus. Diabetes is caused by impaired control of blood glucose levels and is characterized by hyperglycemia, a state of chronically high blood glucose. There are two main types of diabetes. Type 1 diabetes, or juvenile onset diabetes, affects a minority of diabetics. It arises from an autoimmune disorder where a person's immune system mistakenly attacks and destroys over 90% of its own pancreatic beta cells. This strongly impairs insulin secretion and glucose storage and is why type 1 diabetics are especially prone to having wild changes in blood glucose levels throughout their day. Type 2 diabetes, on the other hand, affects a wider population and mostly targets adults. Type 2 diabetes is often brought on by environmental factors such as obesity, inactivity, and an unhealthy diet. Unlike type 1 diabetes, insulin is still produced in type 2, but its ability to cause glucose uptake into body cells is reduced. This causes glucose to accumulate in the bloodstream, leading to hyperglycemia. While nowadays diabetes is treated with insulin, this solution was not always available. In fact, until the 1920s, the most common treatment for diabetes was starvation diets, where patients were kept bedridden and prescribed nutritional regimes that involved consumption of less than 1,000 calories per day. In 1921, this changed when a Canadian research team succeeded in isolating insulin from the canine pancreas. Leonard Thompson, a 14-year-old diabetic boy, was the first human to receive an insulin injection which saw a mild reduction in blood sugar levels. With that, Canadian researchers Frederick Banting, Charles Best, and James Collip had discovered insulin as the hormone responsible for blood glucose modulation. As you can imagine, injectable insulin was a major hit. Since insulin treatment required multiple injections throughout the day, researchers tried to develop long-acting alternatives. 
In Denmark, this was achieved through a zinc-containing, slow-absorbed insulin called lente insulin. The next major milestone would come around 30 years later, as Frederick Sanger discovered the genetic sequence for the human insulin hormone. This was particularly groundbreaking because it meant that we could use bacterial cells to make our own insulin in mass quantities. Not only did this improve affordability, it allowed for the production of tailor-made insulin molecules with different rates of action. At this point, you might be breathing a sigh of relief, thinking that our story has a happy ending. Unfortunately, that's not quite the case. Insulin glargine is a man-made, long-acting version of insulin that is currently on the market to treat diabetes. While a 2018 study estimates a vial of insulin glargine to cost somewhere between 5 and 7 US dollars to produce, in the US, purchasing the same vial costs over $85.76, meaning that the cost of procurement is up to 17 times the cost of production. It's important to note that this comparison does not take into account the research and development costs for the drugs, but in any case, the difference is still significant. This staggering margin is the result of several factors, of which we'll discuss three. First and most importantly is that there is a massive demand for insulin. Millions of people around the world rely on insulin to survive and are therefore willing to pay a hefty price for access to the drug. Second, until relatively recently, only three companies held a monopoly on insulin production, especially in the US. Third, there are massive barriers to competitors wanting to create biosimilar products. But what is a biosimilar product? A biosimilar drug is almost identical to the parent drug, just like how generic drugs can be interchanged with name brand equivalents. Biosimilar drugs represent a step towards reducing the gap to insulin accessibility, weakening the hold of monopolies on insulin production. In July 2021, the United States Food and Drug Administration approved a version of long-acting insulin called insulin glargine YFGN, or SEMGLI. Uniquely, SEMGLI was considered interchangeable to Lantus, which was the existing alternative costing almost twice as much. Nevertheless, biosimilars and the like only represent a band-aid to the larger problem, which is the monopoly on insulin. Solutions must be enforced on the federal level and implemented by physicians. In a 2019 paper by the Mayo Clinic, some changes that could relieve this problem were identified, of which we will discuss four. The first suggestion is regulation against unreasonably high launch prices for new drugs, with the argument that prices should instead be based on the drug's value, similar to the strategies used in other developed countries to price drugs for cancer treatment. Second, the author suggests making it easier for biosimilar drugs to enter the market. To facilitate this, they propose a reciprocal approval process, where biosimilars that are approved in Canada and some European countries are automatically granted approval in the US. Third, Laws should allow access to affordable insulin in emergency situations, including for uninsured type 1 diabetics. Fourth and finally, on an institutional level, products should be favored because they have the lowest price, not because they give more financial benefit to the institution. In the United States alone, there are over 7 million diabetic insulin users and 1 million type 1 diabetics, many of whom, like Silas, struggle with the cost of insulin. In 1922, Banting sold the insulin patent for only one dollar, scorning the idea of profiting off of essential drugs. Little did he and his group know that the same barriers to access they fought to avoid would plague diabetics over 100 years later. The need for affordable insulin is clear, and measures to fulfill this need must begin at the level of federal policy.